There we go. Two seconds, Jane. Maybe just introduce yourself and what your role with the film is by way of a um, test. Jane Loder. I was a filmmaker on the Atomic Cafe. Kevin and I cut it. You didn't hear your dulcet tones. Well, here to say that we seem to be here before you know Lar- Lorber has arrived. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> and last, but um, um, Kevin. Uh, my name is. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> it is I early. Know, wait, I know what my own name is. So just give me a minute. Uh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I got a letter today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Rafferty. Also, uh, are you all essentially co-directors as well as? other roles yes. but is that okay even though i saw atomic cafe years ago i rewatched the other day but i just want to make sure i didn't miss any salient points about it but we're all here together pierce rafferty jane loader and kevin rafferty to talk about a new 4k restoration which is currently being screened at uh, the 4k restored film forum <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I assume you saw it already there, and how was that experience? Uh, anybody can answer. And this is Kevin. Well, it was great. You know, it looks better than it ever has. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeing things in it that I never saw. Before is that right? From the 35 millimeter prints. I mean, because when they do the digital restoration, they they go directly from the original negative, and it's you don't you don't lose quality from the various generations you get when you do film printing mm-hmm. so it, it looks it looks great and it well, sounds really good too oh, yeah. the sound that's sound something people sounds better that's something people don't normally talk about the because we're also caught up with the the film you know and the restoration and the preservation of film so we don't normally think about the soundtrack uh, as being an essential part of that restoration as well it's a good point and that theater really has a great sound system there. When Kevin said directly from the original negative, he didn't mean the original negative that we found. He meant the, the cut A and B rolls that we had assembled, our original negative. Okay. We didn't go back to our original source material. We supplied our elements and then they digitized them. That's a, There's a difference. You know? We did more color correction on this version than mm. we did when we did mm-hmm. the 35 blow up from the 16. So... It, you know, we were able to sit there with the colorist and, and really tell them what it was supposed to look like, and it was yeah. a good experience. Okay, I want to take a step back. For those who don't know about the Tomic Cafe, and I will go over a little bit of this in the my introduction, which is going to be recorded separately, that Atomic Cafe, which came out, what year? Is that 82. Remind? 82. And this was an, essentially, you're telling the story of the whole period from... Uh, Cold War, essentially, and the bomb scare. I mean, the, well, the from, scare of nuclear power and of, of the nuclear bomb. From the development of the bomb yes. through okay. that period. Okay. All done through archive? Right. U.S. government uh, propaganda films would be the main mother load of material that's in the Atomic Cafe. Training films for the Army, uh, public information films that were meant to be seen by the public, like uh, Duck and Cover, instructing school children what to do in case of atomic attack. Yeah. Uh, and you see the flash. Yep. Uh, there are quite a few newsreels and uh, mm-hmm. television commercial in one case, uh, a whole variety of things. But the main thing is that uh, we use no narration and, and uh, it was a movie made without a camera or a microphone. Uh, yeah. So it's all found material. Right. And, and just, to, what was your relationship before the you, you did this film? You guys met, knowing each other, being well, in the industry? Um, I, I had an interesting way of meeting these guys. I was working for um, Seven Days Magazine in New York, and my editor, I remember that magazine. Peter yeah. Biskin, who you may know, Which, of Peter course. sent me down to Washington, D.C., where Pierce and Kevin and our other partners, Stuart, were all living. And I was there to interview Kevin uh, for an article about his uh, first movie, Hurry Tomorrow, which he made with Richard Cohen. And so that I met them in the course of my work. Of course, they knew each other already. <laughs> These guys are brothers. Yes. Yeah, the, right, right? The, you're not cousins, you're no, brothers. brothers. Okay. No, I, it, well, the origins of the film were in 76 when the bicentennial hoopla was going yeah, on. I remember it well. And yeah. I been to a screening at the Pacific Film Archive with a few films that were a, a movie, Bruce Connor and Dangling Parcel by Stan Lauder, and had found a book that compiled government 
propaganda film. Uh-huh. So I approached Kevin, who was an established filmmaker, and said, why don't we make a film about propaganda and stitch it together and tell the story of America through its own propaganda? And he liked the idea, although initially in, said, in theory. Uh, initially he said, well, just gather the films and we'll splice it. To, you know, it'll take a week or, I mean, your initial response was uh, to, for me to go out and find the prints. And, and uh, you may not remember that, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> but that did not, be, that was not the way it evolved. We ended up moving to Washington to research it in a far more substantive way. And the notion really fit Kevin's idea of uh, cinema verite, which was the tradition that he was coming out of. And we plunged into the National Archives thinking it would be a much less uh, elaborate project and, and, and left got, and completed the film five years later. It, it, it became a much bigger, much bigger and deal. more ambitious and, than and, even and, and, knew. You know. and there's a transition in the middle there that Kevin can address. Well, uh, the first day we arrived at the National Archives, uh, we were like kids in a candy store because there are thousands of movies that you can look at and they're available and you can make copies. And... Uh, there was a guy there whose job it was to pull the films off of the shelves and bring bring them to us. His name was Calvin Jefferson, I believe. And this is, uh, this is going to be a detail-oriented conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. And uh, he said, "Okay, look, here's how it works. You, you look through the file folder, file card index here, and you figure out what you want to look at, and then you give me the list of the films. I bring them to you. You look at them. You decide what to order." Uh, and and then you can go back to California tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Now we were not planning on going back <laughs> to California tomorrow. We weren't planning on staying for five years either. But uh, wow. Calvin got to know us very well, and he wasn't entirely happy because we were providing half of the work that he had to do every day. Mm. I, yeah, I but don't is, think he, is he credited in the film? That's the question. Yeah, oh, well, the staff, the staff was credited. Staff of the National Archives. This was long enough like, ago that you could still smoke at the National Archives. You know, right. Yeah. I, I don't wow. think a oh, lot amazing. of a lot of your <laughs> listeners probably don't understand this whole concept because now, right. of course, you can research all the archives from your computer, well, much, and you can download the footage, you know, right there instantly. And so they say, well, why did it take so long to yeah. make this movie? Well, that's one of the reasons because then you had to yes. have the film and you had to look at the film and you had to order the film and, yeah. and sound and, and then editing was a much more one could argue slower slower process <laughs> yes. i guess you know on a steam back with a yeah. guillotine splicer yeah mm-hmm. so wait, so K- kevin you were from the uh, more traditional documentary background you started did you in the, in the 70s, you uh, became a filmmaker? Is that yeah, your story? I, I made student films mm-hmm. in college, and uh, I'd made two half-hour movies before doing Hurry Tomorrow. But, yeah, they were documentaries well, that I shot mm-hmm. uh, with an Aton camera. Uh, you know, By then, though, there was a, the beginning of a, right, of a, a culture around Verite documentary Starting in the early 60s, yeah. It was, yeah. A, it was a revolution. I mean, the, yeah. this lightweight film equipment changed everything. Uh, yeah, right. Go out Thanks and, to Pennebaker and, and those guys, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Leacock, Pennebaker, yeah. Wiseman a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very exciting. Yeah. So you wanted, that was your goal was to... I remember uh, uh, sitting at home. I was working as a janitor, actually, uh, uh-huh. temporarily. And I was watching Frederick Wiseman's... Uh, basic training and I was smoking pot and I was looking at these mesmerizingly long shots that his great Where were you? Were you in a theater? No, I was at home watching it on television on PBS. Oh, right. I guess they did show some of those. In 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd been a bit of an athlete and I said, boy, you know, I could do that. You know, I could hold that camera steady for five minutes. And Uh and, uh, so he he was an inspiration. Uh, Yeah. He's... He's uh he's done this show a few times. Yeah, yeah. It's been a thrill to uh, hang out and just to, so he knows you enough where you can start to joke around a little bit because he's kind of you know a serious guy. But he's underneath that there is a lot of humor. Well, the, believe it or not, Titicut Follies thing was incredible because he he was a law professor at BU uh-huh. and he brought his law class to Bridgewater State Hospital. Mm. And they just could not believe what they were seeing. You know, elderly naked men being hosed down with high power cold water. You're making it hard to, for me to joke around. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I'm also wondering, by the way, how he's adapted that into an opera. But that's another podcast. Do you know about that, right? No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, he, he came back uh, a, a month later with a good cameraman. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how long he spent shooting, but, you know, he created this instant classic, uh, Titicate Follies. Right. Which was banned from screening anywhere in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah. Like, probably still is forever. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be something he's proud of, I assume. Yeah. You know, <laughs> especially because it's his home turf as well. But not only did a classic spring from that, but also a generation of documentary filmmakers who were, like yourself, who you guys who were inspired by that well, type of... Well, it was of... Leacock, Penny Baker, yeah. Drew Associates Drew, yeah. uh, that really got it going. He, he kind of sure. came in a bit later. Yeah. Uh, that's true. And and as you mentioned, the... Uh, the, the the lightweight camera as well as right the sound synced, the sync sound, sound equipment yeah. I remember that guy who used to own the in it quag he had invented the sync sound and he had, had the basic patent for that and he, you know so he took all the money and went out to quag and bought a uh, in- incredible in eastern land. long island <laughs> yeah. huh. So I just want to get a little bit of that background too, because you you had this Pierce, you you had the the conceit to sort of dawn on you as you described already that that it would be really amazing to tell this story through found archive of all these propaganda films and training films and well, it was an excuse to unleash the inner inner collector in me. I mean, I've always yeah. been a sort of obsessive uh, collector of. Or you so. is that right? I still am. Yeah. <laughs> Because it, it's such an incredible conceit, and then it's like, why? This is well, so obvious. The thing that this is such an obvious, powerful way to well, tell the a story. Well, bicentennial. I mean, the, the 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 notion of propaganda was in the air, and the, the the thought that was going through my head at the time was, why always are people talking about German propaganda? Why are all the studies of German propaganda when we were sort of a wash in our own? Yeah. And those and a lot of those early films, the educational type films that we saw in school, had had a comedy built into them. Mm-hmm. So the notion originally was triggered by the educationals that were in dangling dangling parcel and then then the the government book that had them all in there, which was discovered the three thousand four hundred and thirty three US government films and Kevin was drawn to a number of them. I mean the one that got me was you can't get away with it by the FBI, sort of different than Today's it wouldn't be the topic we'd choose right now, but mm. uh, yeah. um, anyway, there were there, there, it seemed as though there was a great wealth, and, and quick research revealed that there was a great wealth waiting to be found at the National Archives. And we met on, um, on on Carter's inauguration day, so we would all have a day that we could remember. We Is sat outside the yeah, we all the three of us met outside the National Archives, mm-hmm. picked Ninth and Pennsylvania, and said just be there then, and then we'll start on the project. One other thing I wanted to mention, which I'm, I'm reading this book now, just coincidentally, about the history of documentary. And there was a whole section, rightfully so, on Lenny Reifenstahl. And, and I was reading how, even though, you know, she was, of course, hired <laughs> or commissioned, rather, by by uh, Das Führer, uh, but that, that um, others then could take the same propaganda and turn it around on itself and and show why we have to fear Germany. In other words, in the mid-30s, the other European countries could take the same... It's, it's just a perspective, an issue of perspective. So it's kind of interesting how you guys, in a sort of different way, but you, you end up doing the same thing where you're taking the propaganda and turning it on itself to do something very, very different, to show you know, why we have to question what we're being fed. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever saw this German propaganda film. It's called Herr Roosevelt Land. And (laughs) it takes all of this footage from the newsreels, which seems happy, you know, to us people jitterbugging and things like that, and and uses it to show the decadence of American culture. Oh, okay. Similar idea, (laughs) then, in other words. So, 1982, you finally, after five years, you have finished making the film... And then what? I mean, it, this was a was this a big hit? Yes, it was a it was a big hit. It it How came did, out uh, uh-huh. at the film forum and immediately it, it did. Yeah, at well, film forum. yes, it immediately started to sell out every show. Every show. And on the basis of that, uh, we got a distribution deal. 
But how did it? Do, how did that happen? I mean, they didn't have David Nin doing publicity for for for. I don't think he was. He's barely knee high at forty uh, we, we some hit, years ago. We hit the zeitgeist. Uh, okay, it was, timing. In terms of timing, it was the height of the anti nuke movement. Uh, That's the true. Freeze movement. Right. Uh, Reagan was terrifying everybody, building up our nuclear arsenal and trying to outspend the Soviets, which he did. And uh, people were concerned that World War III might be right around the, the corner. And our film just happened to come out at that time. And but we did right. have I a great publicist, that. not to take anything away from David, but no. we had David Fenton, who was uh, really? a job, really actually. fantastic publicist. And uh-huh. he, he was working... When we hired him, he was working for the government of Nicaragua, I believe. Right. And then he became our publicist. He'd worked for Muse, Musicians oh, United for Safe yeah. Energy. Oh, sure. They were big on the And so David was yeah. very, very helpful to us. Okay. Um, and Pierce uh, knew some people at the David Letterman show. And, what? Uh, so we were on one of... It was David had only been on the air a couple of months, oh, yeah. and we were some of his first guests. Is that right? So yeah, so you can see twenty twenty third show. Let's, yeah, you can see a, a very amusing clip of a well, Pierce and I on, the, on the Letterman show. Okay, well, um, why didn't you get on the? Uh, uh, nobody <laughs> told me about it. <laughs> no, <that. laughs> no, he went on yeah, the Today. On. He went on the, the Today next, show. The next no, morning, the, the next God. morning, we were on He's the Today show. Complaining about this, he was on the Today show. David Hartman. I'd rather between David Hartman and David Letterman. Well, they just decided he wasn't going to be articulate. Enough. That's what anyway, it was good. You can <laughs> no, see that clip connection. if you. It was my connection to a comedy writer there. Let's go to the videotape, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back to the show. Uh, the Atomic Cafe is an unusual documentary created entirely from propaganda film and newsreels of the 1940s and 50s, which tried to reassure the public and the military that the A bomb, the atomic bomb, was something we could all survive with comparative safety. Two of the producers of the Atomic Cafe are with us, and we'll explain. This is Jane Loader and uh, Pierce Rafferty. Uh, thank you, folks. For... Uh, it, is this fairly accurate, the introduction? The, these, the film is composed of propaganda film, right? Yes. And this was the mission uh, to convince everybody that if one went off in the garage, no problem. That's basically right. Yeah. How did you get interested in this project? Well, we uh, discovered some years ago in San Francisco this book called 300... It was at 3,433 U.S. government films, and we uh, started looking through it and had films like You Can't Get Away With It by the FBI. <laughs> and uh, we started to realize there was a whole wealth of this material out there that no one had ever really assembled into one package and set out to do a film which dealt with propaganda only, and then evolved into, it evolved into something on the A-bomb when we saw all the uh, material that was on that subject. Yeah, was there anything, um, uh, was it surprisingly good, surprisingly bad, or any surprises, or what you thought it would be? Surprisingly, a lot of stuff. There, mm-hmm. there was much more than we ever imagined mm-hmm. when we started researching it. Where did they use these films, on television or in theaters? Or Some were films for children, some were films for the military, some were films for newsreel audiences. They had films on every imaginable subject relating to the bomb, on how to use your car effectively to get out of the city quickly, on how to keep your food exactly ready to go, uh, how to pack up your, uh, uh, your the trunk of your yeah. kit. Right. We have some uh, a sample of uh, what is in the motion picture Atomic Cafe, and I guess... Uh, Great. Uh, that was wonderful. That was very fun <laughs> to watch. Okay, because I was wondering also, maybe you had some champions in, maybe somebody at, like uh, at, in the press who was championing you guys, and uh, maybe everybody was. Well, we and were on a were, number of shows. I went on Mike Douglas, uh, Lily Tomlin promoted the film because oh. came it tonight. Uh, it's so, got, so, it's so, got a, yeah. millions of dollars in yeah. press yeah. because of its timing. Yeah, it was look, clips we, on we, sixty we, minutes. Yeah, we had a good publicist and uh, yeah, a good blah blah blah. But, right, right. You know, we made what a good, film. We made a good movie. <laughs> Yes. Right. No, which, no, uh, getting back to which, it. Which, <laughs> which played in theaters in 17 countries. Yeah, so, but David, yeah, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vincent Canby, who was then the film critic of the New York Times, that was very supportive of the film. He wrote a really good review, and then because he realized he hadn't put a good quote in, he wrote a second uh, review, and then I think he mentioned it a third time. It was in the Porky's Compa- review, yeah, or something. in the Porky's review, he said something like, <laughs> "Well, instead of going to see Porky's, why don't you go see the Atomic Cafe? That would be better." Yeah. <laughs> it's harder thirty-six years later, as I'm sure David could uh, could attest, to get the to get the feature reviews back in there because the papers reviewed it to begin with. Right. Although the Times I see did mention it today. What do you, What do you think of the film now as you watch it? 
all these years later back we, at we were discussing film that farm. last night that the audiences are taking it a little more seriously maybe than than in the intervening it, period from when it came out up till yeah. i mean it's we've hit the uh, we've hit another period when the possibility of atomic war obviously has put the subject back on the map and we live in a landscape of lying government <laughs> officials and this is yeah. a movie about lies uh, yeah but they were it seemed like they Almost uh, just blatant and, and unabashed, and uh, yes, the and lies were a little more were a little, subtle back, a little in, the bit old, more, back right? in the day. Weren't yeah, they? There were rationalizations, <laughs> they were half truths, and, 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 and propaganda and, and through propaganda, euphemistic views of the end of the world. That, whereas now, it's really pretty much say what you want, and it doesn't have any. It's untethered from the truth, absolutely. At this point, so yeah. So where where does this film? Where does it fit in the in the conversation? Is there a conversation? Even? Well, I think I we're going to find out. But yeah, I mean, I'm, we're hoping yeah. it, it, it it stimulates well, the, a response. The, you know, we have a sequence about whether we should nuke Korea back during the Korean War, right? And uh, North Korea, and uh, and that's certainly something that our president has been thinking about lately. You know, uh, he's, so he's threatening. Yeah. We'll see. Whose button is bigger? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's a little frightening. I think people are seriously worried right now, and that you yeah. know they went through a long period of time of not being worried about the atomic bomb. So if we'd come out five years ago, it, we wouldn't be as as relevant as we are today. Right, that's right. Uh, so you were there last night at Film Forum, back at home at the Film Forum, uh, and we'll be there. I guess uh, are you going to Maine tonight? I'm going. I'm so, leaving, but you. Kevin and Kat will, will be there for Q&A tonight, tonight and tomorrow and night. Tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. it's 5. I okay, think. Tonight so at 7, as we record this, this is... Uh, David, what, where are we? Oh, sorry. This is, no, it's okay. Uh, this is uh, the 3rd of August, right? So we're on... It's Friday, yeah. So yeah. you'll be there t- Friday evening. It'll also be opening in L.A. and San where, Francisco. Tell me so. where, do you know? Of course yes, you do. Yes, I do. The Roxy in San Francisco okay. and in... L.A., it will be at three Lamely's, um, the, the Pasadena one, the oh. Santa Monica, and the Claremont. Yeah. You know, something that hasn't been mentioned that really led to the re-release was the Library of Congress choosing it for the National Film Registry in December of 2016. And that, um, in turn, because they're, because the mission of that is to preserve films for the American people, led to the 4K restoration by Indie Collect of the film and led to a distributor, Kino Lorber, being interested in mm-hmm. handling the film in, in, uh, domestically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think without that, we would be sitting, you know, we would not be here today. Right. So it, and it, the Library of Congress paid for the uh, 4K yeah, restoration. They did. For yeah. which we are very uh, grateful. Very grateful, yes. And it's a, it's, it's actually, fantastic. if you look at the other films that are the 1982 class, it's Porkies. To- Tootsie, uh, Raiders yes. of the Lost Ark, E.T., uh-huh. uh, Chan is Missing, and Us, I think that's it. There's only five films. Wow, yeah, that's they, pretty they amazing. They choose 25 a, a year. Yeah. Uh, what I liked was they, that Atomic Cafe was listed alphabetically, so we were first. <laughs> right at the top. We had to skip over Bo Bremel, but then you hit the birds. I mean, you know, we, had, we were good. a distinguished company. Oh, Very I see. Good, in, yeah. the, in the, in the, in the 20, list overall list. Of 25. Oh, no, oh. in the list Every of 25. Every year they choose 25. They choose them oh, from the past. They do. Oh, I and, see. And, and so far, I guess they've chosen more than 700 out of the approximately a million films that have been made. So, um, yeah. I mean, initially when I heard about it, when I asked about what this meant for me, I said, oh, great one-liner for my obituary, but I didn't realize they were going to preserve <laughs> the film. And yeah. and so that was a, a far more significant uh, contribution, the fact that the Library of Congress was willing to, or does that for films. It's great. Yeah. Thank goodness, right? We still have... Well, for, exactly. Yes, that they're still able to... Fun films. That that is a remark. It's it's an interesting list. I mean, you, you got you know Casablanca and the Wizard of Oz, but you've also got This Is Menstruation, nineteen forty six. I mean, it, well, the, uh, to its credit, that's a classic. Okay, <laughs> uh, some of the Jim <laughs> Handy classics are on there. Right, um, Rick Prelinger was on the committee for a long yeah, time. He got, he got so. some really interesting documentary uh, yeah. educationals in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you'll have some of the early Edison films are on there, mm-hmm. obviously. Right. I assume there's there's all sorts of reasons why f- films are selected, not just popular appeal or 
box office or what have quality. you. Quality. <laughs> quality. Well, there's a committee and, and, I th- and I even other. People, people yeah. send in rec- I mean, there is some sort there of uh, lobbying yes. by the public. There is. The, the public is allowed to submit their choices, and the Atomic Cafe was nominated. I, I'm just curious, though. A lot of people saw Atomic Cafe. And, you know, why didn't you follow up? Like, uh, You mean as the three of us? Yeah. Well, I think we were ready to go our separate ways at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I started, I I wrote a novel, a collection of short stories, which were both published by Grove Press. You know, Pierce um, founded a stock footage archive. I I actually did have another deal, much (laughs) much maybe to everyone else's uh, here at the table's uh, irritation. But I had a deal briefly with Norman Lear Mm -hmm. to do this same sort of film about about sex ed films and and sort of failed at doing that but it was taken over and released as a totally different film with a narration uh called heavy petting uh but i you know they credit me with writing it or something but Uh originally we had the deal and and then switched over i switched over to running a film archive and starting a film archive in in new york um which was sort of in the meat market which was parallel to rick prelinger's operation in the meat market Mm -hmm. For you 10 should, years. Yeah, so. you should understand, like, for for five years, a lot of that five years, we all lived together in the same uh, house. <laughs> so we were really ready to go our separate ways by the, by the end of the five-year period. I see. <laughs> Where was this? It was in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right on Highway 50. If you went one way, you could end up in Nevada. <laughs> you went the other way, you went downtown Washington. And in the fall, the leaves on the slick road would cause car crashes oh, right outside. Oh, really? And uh, there was talk at one point of setting up a sound-activated camera to capture some of these crashes. That could have uh, been your follow-up film. Well, it could have been. You know? Uh, well, just to remind everybody, the Atomic Cafe is going to be screening for a couple of weeks. At least it has a two-week run yep. at the newly, by the way, restored Film Forum. Uh, no, but the re- Film Forum has also just opened its doors. Your, in fact, your film is the inaugural one of the inaugural films that are at the new Film Forum. Uh, so we'll we'll keep people abreast of. Uh, also, where else they're going to see it in the West Coast. And then, is there a plan? Just real briefly, do you know is there a plan to re-release this uh, on other? Platforms, uh, I think first they'll do the theatrical yes, and the course. repertory. Yes. Right, and right, 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 as course. Pierce was just telling me, how many dates do they have already I booked? Think David would know eighteen, or it seemed to be booked. Yeah, um, so, so eighteen venues. I know so, we're going to so be it's in beyond. Chicago. So it's going to go wide. Um, uh, I mean, yeah. uh, and it, over the course of the uh, late summer into the fall, I guess. Mm-hmm. Right? Makes sense. Yes. Uh-huh. And then uh, maybe maybe they'll re-release. It makes sense to re-release it right now. You know, as, although you know. Why would... I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be on Netflix, and the reason I know that is because the old Careful DVD which... was yeah. on Netflix, and they just, um, knowing that we were doing the 4K, they just removed it. So, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> well, it also <laughs> makes good. sense in light of that. It's if it's going to come out theatrically, they don't. It makes sense for both sides, Netflix and you know the Kino and everybody, to not have it mm-hmm. available so easily, so, yeah. right? On 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 uh, your phone. <laughs> You know, right. or wherever people watch the things like that. Listen, guys, it was great meeting you all, and I wish you the best and uh, uh, with the, with uh, the Atomic Cafe and everything else. Uh, it was really Thank great you. meeting Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, let me now. This seems so silly. Did the government actually believe what they were telling us, or did they not know, and so they chose to make everything seem to be relatively harmless? Well, I I don't think they believed it. I I think they consciously, especially with the soldiers, consciously tried to reassure them so that they would do as they were ordered, Mm -hmm. which is to, you know, participate in these atomic bomb explosions which endanger their health when they're now getting cancer from... Yeah, but the, the point is, did they know there were negative things going on, or were they just assuming that there would be questions and people would be worried, so they produced That's these things? It's hard to prove. Yeah. It's very hard to, to prove. I think they knew, and a lot of uh, evidence is coming out now that it would support that contention, but it's impossible at this point to say. The, the scientists, for example, wore suits at a lot of these tests where the soldiers marched into the blast area. Uh, all the GIs just had regular clothing. It, it's... This is 25 years ago, 20 years ago. It's, uh, yeah.